Welcome to the bonus clip for Solar Punk Presence, Season 5, Episode 9. In this bonus clip, Michael DeLuca reads an excerpt from his novel, The Jaguar Mask, which is available from Stelliform Press. Okay, this is the opening scene from my book, The Jaguar Mask, which is coming out in August from Stelliform Press. Christina's Dream. Four angels of death in the colorful plumage of trogons hunted the crowded city market, wearing the gang-tattooed, barely pubescent bodies of Mareros, carrying machine pistols painted the pale of maize husks burned to ash. Though the Mareros mugged warrior faces and joked, contesting as if under duress to parrot devil-may-care vulgarities, the angels' gazes never wavered, eyes fixed in their sockets like the eyes of owls. People fled from them or didn't. A man, lying discarded under a jagged-toothed awning, raised a hand, a ring, dull gold and emerald in shadow, and whispered something to the one with the half-skull face tattoo whose angel's tail feathers were barred volcanic blue and white. He repeated it. The one in the Santa Muerte shirt touched the faint fuzz of boy mustache above his lip with a powder-burned finger. They didn't make any more jokes. Down the street of stalls where men in mirrored glasses tried to sell your stolen cell phone back to you, through close-hung canyons of cooking implements, past shit-smelling bundles of live turkeys trussed in mesh sacks, past a pair of uniformed policemen who looked the other way, the angels proceeded to a comedor at the end of a row. The comedor Santa Rosa de Lima was distinguished from the others only by its glowing coat of saffron paint and the small crowd of people in line at the lunch counter, who, at the angels' approach, scattered in a burst like sparrows. Above the narrow eat-in table by the kitchen hung two of Christina's framed paintings, of the Virgin and Antigua in a hurricane, and a string of paper letters that once said, Happy Birthday, cut and reassembled to read, Pray for us. Beneath them, a pair of government employees sat with an absurdly tall, distinguished foreign diplomat folded double over plates of fried chicken and rice. Christina's mother emerged from the kitchen, brushing flour from her hands onto her grease-transparent apron, shouting a warning, drowned by the chainsaw running on empty rattle of bullets that painted them, all four, in red against the saffron-colored wall. It came as something like a dream, on the bus with the Death Harbinger newspaper twisted in her lap under the baby and her phone crushed in her fist, buzzing. Her tia Constancia this time, or again, she'd lost track. But it couldn't be a dream, because nobody could dream aboard a crowded, rickety bus careening around the sides of mountains except babies and old women who'd been practicing all their lives. So, not a dream. A vision. The phone quit buzzing, then started again. Don't answer it, said Lencho sleepily, his slim hips twisted sideways on the bench seat to accommodate a bulky stranger. But Christina was Mama's oldest, her favorite, as agreed by everyone but Christina, making her chief among the bereaved, as well as the one they would all come to from now on about everything. She didn't know how to get out of it. She didn't know who to anoint in her place or how to be cruel enough to visit it on anybody else. She didn't know how the family would change, and it scared her. Tell me, she said into the phone, a finger in her other ear against the bust loudspeaker blasting a tin ranchera. There's a girl at the door, said Tia Constancia's voice, high and panicky, intercut by the mountain's shadow. At your mother's house, a girl, she says she worked there, at the comedor. She's crying. Let her in, said Christina. The driver, barely visible past a topography of heads, bags, and babies, hunched into the brake and cut wide around teeth marks where the ravine was eating the road. Everybody leaned left. A rust and blue hatchback bound in the other direction screeched to a halt, honking like an angry jay. What? Sorry, Tia. Christina worried for the bundle of colorful, meaningless canvases on the roof of the bus. They represented weeks of work, potential months of groceries and phone bills, and not one shred of emotional investment. Let them fly. What if she's lying? Costanza repeated. This is the city. It's dangerous. She could have read it in the news. She could be a thief. Christina's Tia Constancia cherished worry as a basic element of human interaction, like smiling or physical touch. Mama considered it a form of procrastination. How they developed these opposed but complementary traits was something their children would never be permitted to understand. Now Constancia was the oldest. But the city was dangerous. A necessary evil to making a living, according to Mama. Christina preferred the highlands, where the balance of their enormous family remained, so scattered across mountain hamlets that they never got together anymore. They'd get together now. Would you rather leave an innocent girl who just survived a terrible trauma crying on the doorstep, 
said Christina, or maybe risk letting a thief in to steal Mama's saints. What would the saints say? What Mama would say, she didn't have to guess. Son Gregorio, forgive us. The saints can speak for themselves, Colocha. A pause, some muffled argument. Who else was at the house? I'm letting her in, said Tia in a tone of warning. It's on your head now, Colocha. She hung up, or the call faded. Already they were lurching down out of the clouds into sprawling outskirts that leapt and shivered past the windows. Vehicle chop shops, tiendas, pandering political billboards, concrete block buildings haloed in rebar, drifts of offal in the armpits of switchbacks. The baby coughed and spat up, restless in sleep. Christina wiped him with her shawl. Let me, said Lencho. He likes me better. She was so tired already. She squirmed to lay Miguel Angel on his brother's shoulder, then took the twisted-up copy of the diary with its tabloid headline and forced it out through the crack in the window, where the wind tore it open and disseminated the sheets fluttering into the valley. She pressed her forehead against the skin-textured brown plastic of the seat in front of her and closed her eyes. As for the rest of the book, I'm afraid you're going to have to go read it. Again, it's known as The Jaguar Mask by Michael DeLuca, and it is available from Stelliform Press. So, uh, pre-orders until August of 2024, and after that, you can just buy the book. 